this is the first program in the series that we were developing on academic books. Our very first guest is Bill Miller, a law school professor at the University of Michigan, who's written a book called The Anatomy of Disgust, published by Harvard University Press. Bill, how did you get into the idea of disgust and the anatomy of disgust? Well, the, the non-serious answer would be I have four little kids, but the serious answer is is I actually, my academic career kind of inevitably led there, and it's, uh, uh, I started out, or still am, actively interested in heroic society, blood feuding culture, um, the whole politics of revenge, honor, shame. So I wrote a book on honor and shame called Humiliation, and then I decided this would be the necessary sequel, because on one side you have a person being, if the person feeling shame or feeling humiliation is usually reacting to another party looking at them with either contempt or disgust. In the case, of if somebody's looking at you like this, like this, or like this, you will, if you're not certain of your own standing in the world, maybe lapse into shame and humiliation or, or vengeful fury, one or the other. So I wrote the book about the, the reactive side, and now I was going to write a book about the set of emotions, mostly disgust, but also some contempt, that make people or express the view here that this person here is lower and not worthy of respect or the source of contamination or something. I thought it was interesting that in the book you stated you had an interest in medieval times and in that one book by, uh, on the anatomy of what was it? Melancholy. Melancholy. Yeah. How did you get that interest and how does that play into this idea? Of this well, there's another thing, I guess, with this book and the one that I wrote before, Humiliation, uh, is that I, there's a, a kind of a, an implicit kind of rejection of the 20th century way of talking about motivation talking about our inner lives. Um, and I wanted to go back to uh, a style of writing, psychological writing, that I thought was actually more fruitful about what how we're motivated uh, in public and social settings to kind of acquit ourselves well or to impose our will on others. And uh, one of the people who writes well in that vein was, a, was a, a, an Englishman in the early 17th century, Robert Burton, who cataloged stories about the scholar's disease, melancholy, we would call it modern day depression. Um, and it was just a style of going about talking about human motivation that I meant to kind of hope that I could recapture to some extent. Uh, I think we lost with the rise of, of science and the rise of a certain professionalization of psychology and offshoots into psychiatry and, psychoanal and psychoanalysis that we've lost a very kind of skillful and insightful way about talking about human motivation. And uh, you see it still in novelists, um, but, when, but we don't give them the same kind of expertise quality in matters of, psych uh, matters of psychology. Uh, so I'm trying out to recapture certain 17th, 18th, and starting to fall, deteriorate through the course of the 19th century way of talking about human motivation. One of the things I'm interested in is the absolutely kind of seamless complexity of the rule systems which bear upon every aspect of our social existence. How close we can sit at each other, what rules I can have for maintaining eye contact with you, why looks can, and glances and hostile looks and gazes are adjusted, by, adjusted within micro nanoseconds of, the, uh, of, of Propriety and how we know these rules. At least we, we can't articulate them, but we know when somebody else has violated them because we start to feel uncomfortable. We might even start to feel disgusted. Is that what I'm interested in is norms and their violation and the sanctions one suffers or imposes on others for violating them, um, and a much broader perspective than the merely kind of area that uh, our areas that the courts would look at. So I'm interested in the kind of sanctions somebody would impose on somebody else because they keep their eye contact going too long, or don't keep it going long enough, or, um, or the kind of whole problems of how we protect ourselves against hostile intrusion. And one of the ways, I think one of the ways, and this is another issue that brought me into disgust, um, the reason I know somebody's getting too close to me is I'll start to get ill at ease. 
and if they get really too close to me, I start to get disgusted. So disgust is one of the one of those passions, emotions, along with indignation and certain levels of discomfort that tip you off that somebody's getting too close. They are endangering you. Uh, fear is another one, but disgust is a certain one that says somebody's getting close to you and going to defile you by their closeness, and that's a an interesting light for that very reason. So I think without disgust, we wouldn't have the human being or whatever. Uh, and this, I would claim, uh, in a, through a wide range of cultures and historically through time, uh, we wouldn't be who we are if we didn't have that passion to protect us and to revolt us in various ways. Here's a, give you another example of that. If somebody walked up to you on the street and ran their tongue down your mouth, you feel assaulted and puke. I mean, somebody just put saliva in your mouth, for God's sakes. Yet that very thing is what we will decide to privilege somebody to do under certain select circumstances, which we call love sometimes, <laughs> or at least proto-behavior for love. And that disgust, without disgust, it would be hard to describe what love would look like. So we have disgust there as a kind of a, uh, uh, is that kind of resistance which must be overcome to declare a certain relationship special. They don't need to, sex, it's obvious. I mean, sex, you mix body parts and fluids that are just sources of revulsion everywhere. But even between parent and child, I mean, what's my relationship to my kid? It means carting the excrement away. It means getting it on me without, with, with, and learning not to experience the horror and revulsion I would have before I was ever a parent and could possibly imagine doing such things. But the very fact that I have to overcome certain disgust mechanisms, that I have to violate certain disgust rules to be a good parent, is it, it shows just how important disgust is into defining these kind of relations of intimacy. So without, I, you know, I, I could say, I'd say it's somewhat tongue in cheek, but the exaggerated claim would be that without, this, uh, this is too strong. But without disgust, we don't have love. But that's probably going too strong. Um, but that led me to, to be interested in, to the extent, I, I think the weaker claim might be more right, that, that disgust is an intimate part of what love is about. Uh, that, that's how we signal to another that um, my boundaries are open to you. And how can I signal that? I'll let you do things to me, or I'll do things with you that under any other circumstances would make me puke. <laughs> so now, um, so I mean, the, the, I, I, now that leads to kind of a historical, kind of interesting historical issue. Now let's put it back in a period that I love to think about, the Middle Ages, where the level of hygiene, you know, people bathe, who knows, not very often. They have maybe one change of clothes, perhaps. Poorer people had only the one set of clothes they wore all the time. Needless to say, odors would be rather tense back then, and what would it mean? What could you do to signal privilege to somebody else in, an, in, a, in a world of such intense, foul odor? And it seems uh, that disgust had a very healthy life in the Middle Ages. It was still that mechanism which indicated the presence of defilement. And, and although defilement might have been defined differently back then, and it was in many ways, uh, you still have excrement being the absolute lowest grade substance there is. Uh, the sexual substances being even lower graded than they are now. Um, so in fact, the very same things that pretty much horrify us horrify them too. Uh, even in spite of the fact that they had to be inured to a good, to a lot of excrement around, and certainly body odors and rot, the smell of rot. They didn't have as many technological ways of dealing with, you know, no, one wonders if you know. One wonders if they just just got inured. You know, <laughs> after you smell a lousy smell long enough, you get used to it. But that not with all smells. We're remarkably, um, we're remarkably uh, unable to get used to certain odors. Um, the reason the skunk has done so well you know, is because other animals do not get used to that odor. If they got used to that odor, there'd be no evolutionary advantage in having that skunk musk. It would cease warding, warding people and hostile predators off. But the fact is, is that it always smells bad, no matter how used to it you get. It stays still around smells bad. But of course, our beliefs are, are very closely connected. A, a certain smell that might smell like excrement or 
feet or what the most rank feet you can imagine. If told that that's just Limburger cheese or some other kind of cheese, then it ceases to bother you. So, so a knowledge of how contaminating the source is uh, will determine, in fact, under a lot of settings, whether a particular odor is disgusting or not. One, one yeah. question I had is, is there a project you're looking at after this? You've had accumulation. Well, I, I, I think the larger project, the larger project is uh, a kind of a close look at uh, at the emotions and vices that uh, make us who we are, uh, and that, that because of a certain piousness about our kind of public discourse, we don't like to talk. But I kind of, here's another, this is to go jump a little far, far afield. Um, of all the kind of mean-spirited, nasty passions we have, like envy, malice, um, growl is envy, malice popped into my head, disgust. You can talk about envy and malice. Nobody thinks there's anything wrong talking about envy and malice. Um, jealousy, mean-spiritedness, selfishness. We can talk about all those things. There's an elaborate public discourse about that, but up until the kind of general pornographization of mm -hmm. the American culture, you couldn't talk about disgust. You could not talk about disgust because talk, it would talk about things that we simply publicly wouldn't talk about. Now, so in other words, it's much easier for us to treat of the mean-spirited soul, the, 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 to treat of the foulness of the spirit than it is to treat of the foulness of the flesh. Um, not that disgust doesn't also, but we, we have dis the disgust reaction for moral failings as well as physical matters. And that's one of the more interesting things about the, the sentiment, is that it appears to just start with the kind of human body and human production and reproduction, um, excretion, secretion, superation, all that stuff, and then expand outward so that the emotion actually colors the political and moral order. And so, it's, so it's kind of interesting that there's certain vices that elicit disgust rather than anger. Um, uh, give you a, this won't uh, map on it precisely to everybody's experience, but um, we tend to be disgusted by those kind of moral failings that go along with certain professions that do dirty work. Lawyers, ah. um, hangmen, um, politicians. And their vices are those kind of vices that disgust us. Why are they their hypocrisy, uh, cruelty, um, pomposity, all that kind of stuff. Uh, stupidity is not technically a vice that's associated with those people, but it's a vice that often elicits disgust. Probably nothing elicits disgust more than craven, cowardly, fawning, abject behavior. So the disgust ha is, a, has, is a moral passion, and it, uh, it, it is part of what punishes uh, people who behave in disgusting fashions. <laughs> and it, yeah. right, it rightly should do that, and it's a good thing it does. <laughs> now the one, there's a bad thing about disgust, and that is that it casts its moral net a little too wide, so we, we are disgusted by people we don't find attractive, or by the elderly, or by the deformed. But we are disgusted by things through which some part of our of our understanding says that they can't be held accountable for because they didn't choose that they had no will in selecting that. Still, even though we have, you know, it's taken us two thousand years to tell us we can we should only really blame people for things they could have chosen not to do, we still blame people for things they could. We will invent accounts that they could have chosen not to do that. They could have. They could have stayed out of my sight. <laughs> and so you'll blame them for that. And on, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's probably a bad thing. It still seems to be that the, it, it is how disgust operates as a moral sentiment. It tends to take a lot into the moral domain that other parts of other moral sentiments say we shouldn't have there. Um, we should push the fact that, that what, what disgust does, let me make it, use a couple of two big words here. Um, Disgust tends to make the, uh, the aesthetic realm, the realm of beauty, uh, it refuses to recognize it as a realm independent of the realm of the good. So disgust re refuses to recognize the distinction between the moral and the aesthetic. It drives it all into the moral. And 
that's the way the Greeks probably understood it. A lot of heroic cultures, if the, um, the description in the Iliad of the gods laughing at the crippled god, Hephaestus, they make him limp before him and they laugh. They think it's funny how ridiculously awkward he is. And that doesn't sit quite right with us yet. Anybody who went to high school and grew up with all the sick jokes that we probably felt embarrassed, disgusted, and laughed at, or had some sinful delight in telling them or hearing them, says that the old kind of Olympian way of looking at these things is still a big part of our psyche. In writing about a topic like this, what kind of response have you gotten, or have you yet? The book is just coming out. Oh, the book just came out. Um, in fact, I, it just came out two days ago. We're, we're, we're doing this on what day? We're doing this on March 23rd, and uh, uh, the press officially re released the book March 20th, but it's been available for about a month, I think, in the bookstores. And it's an academic book. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty hard going there in places with the philosophical issues and stuff like this, but it's, uh, with disgust, it's hard to keep away from from Well, like you're saying, disgusting. With, with this being not a uh, widely considered topic in public discourse, it seems to me there'd be some difficulties that, you know, the ordinary media would have in dealing with it. Uh, well, there, there's something in the book to offend everybody, although one of the <laughs> things, one of the things is, is that um, uh, I try, you know, it's very hard, I try to remain, I'm a fastidious sort, and that's why, one of the reasons I felt especially qualified to write about this, I, I, I mean, I live, my, every second of my life, my inner life is threatened by the disgusting, so I, I have a keen kind of, just for, for whatever reason that, you know, might be attributable to how my parents raised me. I just feel like I have a special relation to this passion. But it's hard to, so I maintain a fastidious tone in the book. I didn't want to make cheap moves towards kind of the, the um, prurient and stuff like that. And uh, so it's kind of, but you, it's it's kind of prissy in parts, but of course when you're prissy, you run the, you run the, the, the risk of, Inter reintroducing the comedy, or the, the kind of jokes you're trying to avoid. But it's rough finding the tone to, to talk about disgust and, 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 may, and signal to others that you're dead serious all the way through. I thought it was interesting that you really didn't uh, rest on any particular intellectual tradition or position as you were looking at this. It, it was really you had quite a broad perspective in looking at this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. This is, um, there's a problem. This is truly interdisciplinary kind of work. Uh, it's based on my lifetime of reading in many ways. Um, there's been some very interesting recent work in, in, in academic psychology on disgust, of course, you know, made use of that. But most of the stuff comes out of the, the, the just a, a lot of reading in the Western literary tradition. It's mostly it's 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 pretty much Western in its focus, with a few anthropological gestures towards towards non-Western cultures. But I'm interested in the whole kind of discourse of disgust and sin uh, through the Latin Christian discourse. So um, I delved into medieval materials. Uh, a lot of Jacobean materials because of the uh, s hatred of sexuality that seems to be central in Jacobean tragedy and Shakespeare's great plays, Hamlet and Lear particularly, um, but in other Jacobean tragedy. And then, of course, Jonathan Swift. You can't write about disgust without writing about Swift. Well, we want to thank you, Bill, for joining us to, in this program. Uh, as I said, it's the first uh, new program that we're going to be basing at the Shaman Drum. Uh, Bill had a signing party there just a few days ago. And uh, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to agree to this interview about your new book, The Anatomy of Disgust, published by Harvard University Press. Hello. My name is Jim Schaefer. I'm the host of a new program on community network television, CTN, called riprap. Riprap, according to the dictionary, is some broken stone used as a foundation or as a sustaining kind of support. We prefer the definition used by Gary Snyder in one of his books of poetry, which talks about riprap being some broken stones 
used to provide footing for animals or human beings across icy passages and mountain pathways. We hope that this program will provide some kind of foundation for or footing for you to take a look at the exciting issues explored in academic books. The way we're going to do this is by interviewing authors of these books on a wide variety of topics. We may also, as we get the opportunity, explore other cultural developments in this community and across the country and around the world. A television program like Rip Rap is a complex undertaking that requires a great deal of help from a great number of people. Before we end this first episode of Rip Rap, we would like to offer our particular thanks to the following people. Carl Port, the owner of Shame and Drum Bookstore, for his advice and enthusiastic support over the past two years as we developed this concept. Raymond Grew, who, as editor of the International Quarterly, Comparative Studies in Society and History, immediately recognized the value of bringing the works of scholars into the medium of television. Karen Schaefer, my wife, for her technical assistance and advice. John Gray, the Associate Director of the Continued Education Department of the University of Michigan Medical Center, who has also offered technical advice. And then the CTN Network, the Community Television Network, who provided training, facilities, and advice on developing this concept and providing the necessary technical assistance. So again, keep an eye out for more episodes of Rip Rap. We've got more interviews scheduled and we'll be back with you shortly.